In our culture, we tend to live in our heads. And more and more as screens become ubiquitous, iPhones, iPads, we live in our eyes. And that visual information is just a small part of what, of what we know. But we tend to privilege that. And there's a lot of other awareness that's going on in our own body that we tend to block out. We're interested in our thoughts. We're interested in the images we can create in the mind. And to pay attention to those, we often have to block out large areas of our awareness. As we bring the mind to concentration, we have to turn that around, lose interest in the thoughts, and develop an interest in what else is going on in the body. The one tendency we have to fight as we're getting more aware of the body, that's when we do the scan going through the different parts is a sensation that we're up here in the head watching something down there. Whereas what you want to get in touch with is the awareness already down there. What is the awareness of the hand in the hand? What is the awareness of the arm in the arm? And same with the feet, the legs, all the different parts of the body. There's already an awareness there. Can you get in touch with that? Can you take an interest in that? Sometimes it helps to think that you're backing down into your body, so you're not trying to look out your eyes at the different parts. But as you go down the back, where are your arms in relation to the back? Where are your legs in relation to the back? And think of your awareness spreading down back there. The thoughts will still be going on. But you have to tell yourself, you're not interested in them right now. You're trying to get more in touch with what's going on in the rest of the body. And the breath is a good vehicle for doing this, because the breath is the element of the body that you can have the most control over. You can make it longer, shorter, deeper, more shallow, more refined. You can also refine your awareness, so you're aware of currents of breath that are not, obvi that are not obvious at first. <clears throat> like listening to a far distant sound. You have to make yourself very quiet, and then that sound becomes clearer. In the same way, the different levels of energy in the body are there already. There's even a still level of energy, but you can be aware of them only when you get the mind really quiet. And so as we practice concentration, try not to think of it as just stamping out thought. Think of it as an exploration. And you're taking interest in a new territory, a territory that's been blocked out before. But these are going to open up too. Now the problem is as you're opening up, sometimes you find there are things that you subconsciously have been tamping down in there. You're going to encounter those sometimes. Old emotional wounds, sometimes not so old. And our immediate reaction is when we run into those is we go back into our head. Because as John Lee says, you work around them. You don't start out by focusing on the pains. You focus on the areas that are relatively okay. And you learn to appreciate them. This is a large part of our problem, is that if a feeling in the body is not really outstanding, we hardly register it at all. There can be parts of the body that are perfectly okay. But as far as our normal habits are concerned, they're not of interest. We're interested either in the intense pleasures or the intense pains. And we get to know our body only, say, when we're able to excite our lust. And otherwise, we're not interested. 
aside from just feeding it when it feels hungry, but otherwise we don't pay it that much attention. But there's a lot down in here to learn about. Because not everything in the nervous system is decided up in the brain. It's like you have this large corporation in here. And you've got the chairman of the corporation up at the top, top floor. But you've got the lower functionaries. And they're not sending all the issues up to the top floor. Sometimes they're making decisions without the CEO knowing about it. And those are things you want to look into. Because sometimes a revolt can start down there. A revolt against your best interests. And if you're aware of it only when it finally reaches the top office, and then you're in trouble. You want to know if something's malfunctioning, you want to know if something, somebody's discontent. Down on the ground floor and all the other floors in between. And the only way we can do that here in the mind is to do just what I said. Take an interest in the breath. Take an interest in the body as it senses itself. As I said, the, the awareness of the hand in the hand. The awareness of the stomach in the stomach. And the sense of well-being can come when you get all these different areas of awareness beginning to blend together. They feel at comfort with one another, at ease with one another. And as for the parts you can't make comfortable yet, just let them be. Don't push them around. Because they can be hypersensitive. It's almost as if they don't trust you. And so the more you poke into them, the more they're going to clam up, tighten up. So you treat them the same way you would treat a wild animal. <clears throat> don't look straight at the wild animal. Pretend like you don't notice the animal. And it will feel more at ease. And over time it may come to trust you. And it may open up. And it will especially come to trust you if it sees that you're treating the rest of the body well. So try to think of the body as fluid as possible. So you don't create lots of unnecessary tension. Unnecessary boundaries. <clears throat> you want your sense of awareness to be as continuous as possible, both in time and in space. And allow things to be as fluid as possible. Because when you set up patterns of tension, it's like creating a wall. And then the the water element, uh, the liquid element in the body runs up against that and it creates pressure. To you find any patterns of blockage or tension, just think of them dissolving away. Or you can think of having a, a knife in your mind that cuts, cuts, cuts through any places where these little dots of tension may be forming into a pattern. Because a lot of that pattern is in your own perception. So you try to create a perception that undoes that, cuts through that, pulverizes it, atomizes it. And this way, of course, you're dealing with those three fabrications we've been talking about. Bodily fabrication, the breath. The verbal fabrication, how you're talking to yourself about this. <clears throat> In other words, trying to get yourself interested to get yourself interested in what's what's going on in this level of your awareness. And then when the feelings of pain come up, you know how to deal with feelings of pain. When feelings of pleasure come up, you know how to deal with feelings of pleasure. You're not overcome by them. You work around the pain, you learn how to maximize the pleasure. And you do that a lot with your perceptions, the images you're holding in mind. And as you get more and more familiar with the territory, 
you got a better and better sense of where it is when the mind finally settles down, where it likes to settle down, and the things that are getting in the way. You got a better sense of them as well, which means as you meditate over time, if you're paying attention to these things and approaching it as a skill, then you can get more and more quickly to that center and work more and more quickly through the basic obstacles that you know are going to be there. This is a tricky business, learning from your past meditations, what's useful to remember and learning what to put aside. What you put aside is your memory of the results. I had this wonderful meditation the other day and it's not getting back there. And of course, as you sit there thinking about that meditation, you're not creating the causes for getting good concentration right now. That kind of memory is not useful. The useful memory is the one that reminds you, I've had this problem before and this is what I did. In other words, you're looking at the causes. You're trying to remember the skills that you develop. Again, take an interest in this. So that you're able to settle down more quickly. And then you overcome that fear of settling down quickly. The fear of having to maintain this. And wonder how you're not going to get bored maintaining a still state of mind. Again, the antidote to boredom is interest. See that as a challenge. And see the thoughts as saying boring as an obstacle, because sometimes the thoughts of boredom come up simply because you're not used to doing one thing again and again. But other times, there are things that are about to be revealed in the mind that part of the mind doesn't want to see. And it uses boredom as an excuse to look away. So watch out for that in particular. We need this interest in this aspect of awareness, the awareness in the body. Because as the Buddha said, if we don't have the pleasure that comes from this, the mind is going to go to sensory pleasure, sensuality. Fantasies about food, fantasies about sex as its way of avoiding pain. The problem with those fantasies, of course, is on the one hand, as the Buddha said, they create tendencies in the mind. The mind gets bent in that direction. Both in terms of what it wants to do in this lifetime. And then as you get to the point where you realize you can't stay in this body anymore, if sensuality is your escape from ordinary everyday pains, then it's going to be your escape from, from death, the pains of death whether the, the physical pains of illness in the body or the mental pains of having to leave behind the people and the situations you know. If that's your knee-jerk reaction to pain, then when pain comes on really strong, that's where you're going to go. And the les levels of being that come from that kind of fantasy are not necessarily all that good. So you need to give yourself a better alternative. Where do you look for your pleasure? You want to look for a pleasure that's harmless. You want to look for a pleasure that doesn't befog the mind. And we find that in this awareness of the body, the awareness of the breath, the state of mind that gets into concentration and finds a real sense of ease and well-being as it can expand its awareness down the back, out the legs, down the arms to the hands, <clears throat> all around the body. It learns how to be at peace with the sensations that are coming up. What sensations you can change, make more comfortable. At peace with the sensations you can't change, you will learn how to work around them.
So you get, this becomes more and more your home, the place where you feel at home, where the mind goes when it's looking for pleasure. This is why they call this Vihara Dhamma, the mind's dwelling. And for most people, their mind's dwelling is in sensuality. But that's a precarious place to be. This is a lot more solid. And a lot safer. It requires skill, but the skill is something that we can all master. There's so many other skills we develop in life. It's a shame that we tend to neglect this one. But if you can take an interest in the potentials for concentration, there's a lot to explore here. As the Buddha said, concentration can provide a pleasant abiding. And because it is a pleasant abiding, then you can be more solidly in the present and you get to be more acute in your mindfulness and your alertness. And in particular, you begin to see where defilements are coming up in the mind. Where, where does greed come from? Where does anger come from? Where does delusion come from? Sometimes the little seeds start spreading someplace else in the body, aside from in the head. And if you're aware throughout the body, you get to see the seeds as they form. And you understand them a lot better as you see them form. So take an interest in concentration, or as the Buddha says, have some respect for concentration. It can do a lot for you. If you give it the space to do its work.